In a few minutes, we'll get to our debate on the history, challenges, and future of reading. But first, the growing critique of Barack Obama's foreign policy. It has not been a good month for American standing in the world. Uh, what the Prime Minister has offered in uh, specifics of a uh, restraint on the policy of settlements, which he has just described, no new starts, for example, um, is unprecedented uh, in the context of prior to negotiations. The slings and arrows are out for Obama's Israeli-Palestinian policy and for its handling of the Iranian election debacle. We want the Western nations and the Obama administration specifically to seek tougher sanctions against the Iranian regime. Hillary Clinton. Obama raised eyebrows and hackles by skipping the 20th anniversary celebrations of the end of the Cold War and dismayed even strong supporters by what's being described as an amateur hour visit to Japan and China last week. Did President Obama even know or care that several leading dissidents were rounded up, harassed, punched, beaten, threatened, and detained immediately prior to, during, and after the president's visit. Joining us now to discuss Obama's handling of the foreign file, TVO's own international affairs observer, there's Janice Stein. Welcome back, Janice, to TVO. Good evening, Steve. Now, you were in Halifax last weekend, right, for this international security forum, where I gather the, top, the topic of conversation was how well Obama's handling foreign policy. What were people saying? It was um, really across the board. It wasn't a partisan critique. It didn't come from the rights, from what might be called a Republican right or from conservatives. Uh, we had Europeans, uh, Asians there, officials. And uh, at the very least, you had a sense of puzzlement. Uh, the critique really was, well, President Obama can't close. Uh, he's got so many files on the go, he's delivered on none. That was the gentlest criticism. The much stronger criticism came from people like John McCain, uh, who said uh, he's dithering. Uh, uh, he's dithering on Afghanistan. He's prolonged this decision. The administration is leaking its uh, disagreements in public and leaking those disagreements in public, and that's probably the strongest criticism you can make is giving comfort to the enemy. Hmm. Leslie Gelb, whom you know, of course, President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, seen by many as kind of the dean of the American foreign policy establishment, and an Obama supporter. Let's read something that he wrote in the Daily Beast. President Obama's nine-day trip to Asia is worth a look back to fix two potent problems, past and future. First, the trip's limited value per day of presidential effort suggests a disturbing amateurishness in managing America's power. On top of the inexcusably clumsy review of Afghan policy and the fumbling of Mideast negotiations, the message for Mr. Obama should be clear. He should stare hard at the skills of his foreign policy team and more so at his own dominant role in decision making. Something is awry somewhere and he's got to fix it. Secondly, the Asia trip presented an important opportunity to carve out a new American leadership role in the world's most dynamic economic region and Mr. Obama missed it. He only scratched the surface in his calls for multilateralism and mutual understanding. He needs to paint pictures of how Washington will help solve regional security and trade problems. Otherwise, most Asian nations will continue their unwanted drift towards China and away from the United States. Amateur hour at the White House is what he called that piece. Is it really that bad? Well, I don't think that, I, I, I think Leslie is unfair. Uh, and particularly on one file, Steve, which is the Asia trip. Uh, which has evoked a lot of comment and negative criticism uh, of Obama in the last uh, 10 days. I think it's unfair uh, if you start the trip in Tokyo, uh, where President Obama actually made uh, his major speech, and I happened to be in Tokyo a day later. What did you hear from Japanese officials? We're worried that President Obama is becoming too close to China and that the special relationship with the United States uh, that we've had uh, for 50 years, in a sense, is going to suffer. So a deep insecurity that the new attention to China will hurt the Japanese. He goes to China, and the critics say, well, he did not meet with dis dissonance, and he did not raise openly human rights. That's true, but we've had other secretaries of state, other presidents who have not done that. And the United States now faces an acute economic crisis, and it was visiting its banker. Uh, let's be honest. 
there is a recalibration of the relationship between the United States and China. And so therefore, not to humiliate your host in public is not a cardinal sin. No sooner did he leave China than you heard aggrieved cries from the Indians. Oh my goodness, President Obama is paying so much attention to Beijing. Uh, we are neglected. We need to be reassured that we are as important to the United States well, as we once were. He tried to do that the he other day, right? He just had a gorgeous yeah. state dinner. So if you actually look at Asia, you have a resurgent Asia. You have growth in China and in India. Uh, you have the United States actually important to all three, and everybody worrying that the other one is going to miss, hmm. you know, be displaced uh, by the Obama administration. That doesn't sound like reactions of people who are marginalizing the United okay, States. Okay, let me come back at you, though, with some more Leslie Gelb, who says that most presidents don't commit to foreign trips without knowing exactly what's going to be announced during the visit. And the quote is, the prospective visit is the jackhammer to nail down the deals. He says Obama got nothing on Chinese currency, nothing on spurring domestic demand, nothing on trade. Why not? You're right. I mean, unless the Gabba's right, he got nothing on Chinese currency, and no American president has gotten anything on Chinese currency ever. That's a really tough issue. Spurring domestic demand, which is a really important part, important part of readjusting the global economic balances, is a 10-year wrote for the Chinese government to follow. And if you look at what they've been doing over the last six months, they've actually taken some important steps. They won't necessarily talk about it in public, but they have taken some important steps. On trade, uh, China um, is, as I said, in a relatively speaking more powerful position vis-a-vis -vis this administration coming out of a terrible reception with unprecedented levels of debt. So it, and China happens to have a lot of money in the bank right now. China has two trillion, two trillion. U.S. dollars. Yeah. Now, the old saying goes, if you owe your banker $100, mm -hmm. uh, your banker's in control. When you owe your banker $100,000, you're in control. Mm -hmm. And there is that element with the United States. We don't want to exaggerate this. But there's no question. There's a readjustment. And I think this is where the criticism is unfair of Obama. He went to signal, we're partners. We need to adjust these imbalances together. Uh, I do agree with Leslie Gelb on some of the other issues. Well, let me mentions. follow up here, because here's how the Financial Times editorial put it last week when it said, any idea that China, with an economy less than a third the size of the U.S. and a GDP per capita roughly the same as Angola's can somehow save the world is ludicrous. Mr. Obama is right to show respect to China. He need not and must not kowtow. Is the president being too deferential? I don't think he kowtowed, and that's really where the issue is. And you know, the critics who say he kowtowed, uh, the evidence they have for this is that he did not raise the issue of human rights. Well, that's only part of it. The other business was the, the very deferential bow to the Japanese emperor, and then I, to the I, Saudi I, king, yeah, I, and to the Chinese officials that he met with as well. Well, again, you know, uh, just having spent a week in Japan, let me tell you, everybody bows. and. You bow back to everybody. Yeah, but, it doesn't but, matter who you are. You bow okay. and you bow back. I know that's really part of the culture. I know Nixon bowed, and I know Clinton bowed. Yes, they, but they did. They didn't bow that deeply. Well, they he bowed. He really bowed deeply, and a lot of people. So we're now we're measuring it. centimeters of bowing. I, I think right? in the states they're not metric yet, so they're measuring inches of bowing. But yes, yes. I, yes. I, I don't think we want to make a mountain out of an <laughs> inch of bowing. Your bowing is part of the culture. Uh, I, there is clearly a question of style here with Obama that he goes out of his way to be respectful, to respect local culture. But if you actually look at the substance in all, in his dealings in Japan, in his dealings in China, and now uh, in the state dinner he held for the Indian prime minister, there's no area of substance where he's given ground. I, I'm sure that in private conversation, he raised many of the human rights issues. He simply chose not to do it in public which means he chose not to stick his thumb in the eye of the Chinese so premier. constructive engagement as opposed it to really beating the drum It really is constructive engagement at a particularly delicate time uh, in the global economy, and that's really quite a sensible strategy. Okay, let me switch to Iran then, Janice, and, and uh, apparently... That's a different story. Here's where we go. Uh, Obama, when he got elected, apparently they were chanting in the streets of Tehran this slogan in Farsi, Obama with a U, Obama, which is Farsi for he is with us. 
There are now reports that the same youths, when they protest in the street, are saying, Uba unhast, which means he's with them. Right. Right. Did he make a mistake in not more actively coming out in favor of the opponents of Ahmadinejad uh, in this election? I think he did. I, I think it was a tough call for him because he ran on, campaigned on, constructive engagement with Iran. So this stolen election couldn't have come at a worse time for him uh, in terms of shaping and giving texture and tone to his foreign policy. However, the stealing was so egregious and the crackdown has been so egregious, the arrest of dissidents, the imprisonment, some have been threatened with execution. It seems inconceivable that a U.S. president would stay as silent as Obama has been. On the other hand, you know, all politics being local, if he'd gotten more involved, the mullahs would have said, look at you interfering in our that's domestic the, affairs. Well, that's the dilemma here, that there is, you know, and Iranians will talk about this dilemma privately, that many Iranians argue that the regime is on the ropes now, that it's lost its legitimacy, and that this is the beginning of the end uh, of this particular regime, and they warn. Uh, that if Britain or the United States speaks out too strongly or gets too strongly engaged, that will simply unify Iranians uh, behind their own regime against the United States. Which is States. a legitimate concern, It's a legitimate concern, concern. Isn't it? Yeah. it is, but I think Obama could have done more. Hmm. I think he could have done more. Let's talk about the end of the Cold War. Uh, the 20th anniversary Huge of the mistake. fall of the wall in Berlin, Huge. he doesn't go. I, that was really difficult to understand. I mean, this is a significant moment. Uh, you had heads of state, heads of government there. He was conspicuous by his absence, and the video that he made and that was shown, you know, as Angela Merkel was walking across the bridge, it was notable, it was significant, and Europeans felt badly snubbed. Now, the Europeans, you heard exactly the same story from them as you heard from the Japanese and the Indians. Obama's focused on Asia, he's focused on the Middle East, he's not interested in Europe anymore, he's not one of us, he really doesn't get us get our story, get our struggle. Hmm. Uh, that was one he should have avoided. Here's, uh, let me just quote Roger Cohen from the New York Times now, of a couple of days ago. He was there in Halifax as well. He was well. there too. Uh, Ieva Kupche, a Latvian defense ministry official here, told me, quote, watching Obama, I worry that democracy is going out of fashion. We in Latvia would not have made it right. without the United States. You know, I, you was, know whether... I was sitting at the dinner table with him, as it happened, with the Latvian with... foreign minister oh, okay. in Halifax, and he was quite um, eloquent about that. Uh, he talked about the long struggle during the Cold War and uh, dependence psychologically on the United States, even though the United States wasn't able to do anything for the Baltic states as well, long as the Soviet Union. Except when the Cold War, which kind of helped. Well, that ultimately but, helped the Baltic states. But, but they're not banging the drum of freedom in the way that previous presidents have. This administration right. is not. I mean, he was, is that a mistake? Know, uh, it is. Um, and, and I think it's, well, again, it's how you do it, right? Mm -hmm. And let's understand that we, the, the last administration believed that you could not only bang the drum of freedom, but you could actually shoot the drum of freedom out of the barrel of a gun. You could bang the drum on the heads of some of your allies as well. But, they, yeah, they but you could also shoot your way <laughs> into the streets of your adversary and bring democracy with <laughs> you. And I think to some extent that's what Obama is retreating from. <laughs> but, you know, listening, um, listening uh, to the Latvians and who were saying it was knowing, it wasn't what the United States did for us. It was knowing they were there. It was knowing what they stood for. Obama has to find a way of articulating hmm. core American values uh, so that people around the world can hear. Here's uh, Henry Kissinger on this issue. It was yeah. quoted uh, again by Roger Cohen in the New York Times. He reminds me of a chess grandmaster who has played his opening in six simultaneous games, yeah. but he hasn't completed a single game, and I'd like to see him finish one. See, that's a different criticism, and it's, it's quite interesting coming from Henry Kissinger, because Henry Kissinger, the ultimate realist, not concerned with fundamental values. It's interest. It's all real politic. It's interests and that, that shape the table. So his is a different criticism. He's saying Obama's taken on too much at once. Israel-Palestine, which is a big mess, mm -hmm. is the only way to put it. Asia, Iran, uh, Afghanistan. He's taken on all of that, and he hasn't delivered on any. 
Now, again, to be fair to Obama, he didn't take on Afghanistan. It's there. He inherited that. He inherited that. Yeah. The economic crisis put him um, in a different position with respect to Asia. He didn't take that one on. Uh, he inherited that one, too. Uh, the one where he led uh, was Israel-Palestine, and that, I think, of all has been the biggest failure. But maybe they should just do what Ed Lutwak suggested, which is, and frankly, Tom Friedman had a column in the New York Times about it the other day, yes, too. Yes, he did. Time to turn our backs on everything in the Middle East and let them figure it out, because as long as the U.S. is there, they're both going to blame daddy until, you, you know, know there are, until they take responsibility there are, for themselves. There are, of course, Palestinians and Israelis who argue that that's what George Bush did. He focused on Iraq, but he fundamentally isolated the Israel-Palestine conflict, did nothing about it and it simmers um, just below the boiling point until it exploded uh, twice, once in Lebanon and then again in Gaza. So you've got to stay engaged on this? You have to stay engaged, but, you, but the way Obama engaged, um, I think, was a strategic error. He raised expectation, and here's, I think, where, your early, where Leslie Gelb's earlier criticism is completely correct. Before you raise expectations publicly, before you say, I'm going to insist on a freeze in the settlement, you make darn sure that when, you're, when your Secretary of State goes, you get the freeze, uh, that you can deliver what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, um, Netanyahu's refusal to free settlements up till now, although an announcement is coming very, very shortly, is a humiliation for the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, Janice, let's remind everybody that we're at your place tomorrow night. Actually, you we're, are. we're going to the you house that Stein built, the Munch Center. Looking forward to it. A program we're calling David, Goliath, and the Goldstone Report. And there's still a few tickets available. We should tell everybody go to our homepage, tvo.org slash the agenda. Click on the Munch Center link if you want to come to our broadcast tomorrow night. And of course, there's our post program web chat as well. So we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks so much. Be there for that.